Australia's greatest all-rounder, lethal with the ball, a swashbuckler with the bat. He had the manner and the bearing of a boy's own hero. He was bold and brilliant and cared little for authority. Instinctive and unpredictable, Keith Miller is one of ESPN's legends of cricket. Lords 1956. At the age of 36, Keith Miller, leading a much weakened Australian attack, returned his best ever test match bowling figures. Oh. Lords in 1956 was Miller's greatest performance, as far as I was concerned. Uh, the hero of the match being congratulated by Neil Harvey. Uh, we desperately needed to win at Lords. Uh, we lost Lindwall with a torn muscle. Pat Crawford, who came into the side, tore a muscle in the first morning, bowled five overs, and uh, it looked as though we were deep in trouble, and Miller bowled uh, a long time in both innings, took five wickets in each innings, ten in the match, and swung the game for us and won it. For me, that uh, you have both of them's match in 1981, for me that was Miller's match. Australia have won by 185 runs. Miller at Lords in 56 produced his, his greatest bowling performance in Test cricket and perhaps a bit ironic that it came in his final Test series but Miller as a, a Test bowler I think had grown through his career and it was a, a great performance, he carried the Australian side, it was the one uh, victory in the series that the Australian side achieved. As a bowler Miller was famously unpredictable. He could bowl as quick as anybody that was around in those days. He didn't always bowl that quick. But, um, you know, and every now and again, of course, he used to just wheel. You know, he only ran 13 paces or 15 paces. But he used to just come and wheel, and, and he'd come, and then all of a sudden he'd get a skip in his run. He'd muck it up so much that he'd bowl a wrong and out of the back of his hand or a leg break or something. You know, like, he was just that unpredictability that, you know, that, that he had that was, was part of his genius. Keith Miller, when he wanted to be, was the most devastating bowler of the time and capable of winning a match in, in a couple of overs. Miller had a short run. Um, uh, he had a very explosive action. Um, and uh, he, he was um, probably as, as quick... His quickest ball was probably as, as quick as anyone at the time and also a, a very a very nasty bouncer. Miller's batting was founded on forward play. He was a master of the drive. I saw him score 200 against Queensland in Brisbane. Absolutely incredible innings. Uh, he came down to Sydney and uh, we played the Englishman here in Sydney in the first match of one of the early matches of the tour. And I can still remember Keith, he got another 200 in that game. He. I'm not joking, straight drove Alec Betts a first bounce, a first ball with a new, second new ball, straight back over his head at first bounce into the showground wall. And it went like a two iron shot, like Tiger Woods couldn't do a two iron better. It was absolutely the most incredible shot. If he hadn't been a bowler, he would have been one of the really great batsmen. Um, Miller was mercurial as a batsman. He was played very correctly. Uh, but he had this attacking outlook uh, and with his, he was tall, with his reach, he could get at practically anything and he could hit fours off really good bowling. And he could have been a master batsman, Miller. Really. Miller was also a captain of imagination and flair. Miller was, uh, to me, a legend. He was someone I copied. I thought he was the best cricketer, best captain, never to captain Australia. And um, he was some, uh, someone who was an instinctive captain. He taught me a great deal on the field when he was captain of New South Wales. When he was uh, appointed captain of New South Wales, and it was Bobby Simpson who told me the story. And Simpson had just come from uh, Western Australia to play for New South Wales, and it was going to be his first match. And uh, Miller was leading the team down on the field, and, Simpson was there, and suddenly the gate man apparently said to Miller, Mr. Miller, you're taking 12 men onto the field. He goes, uh, 
Would one of you gentlemen kindly mind leaving the field? You know, he didn't put it in quite those words. Just a hero type fellow. He's the guy that he used to carry himself beautifully, good looking guy. He always had this dark black hair that he always used to just flick back and was always slicked down. But also, from judging by, you know, talking to a lot of people that played with him, he had, you know, he would have made a tremendous captain of Australia. February 1938, at the age of 18, Keith Miller played his first match for Victoria. He scored 181, but he might have been a Victorian hero in another sport. He was a great uh, Australian rules football player down in Melbourne, and um, he's regarded down there as one of the, the stars of that era. So he, he was an athlete. I think that's the, the best thing. He could probably put his hand to anything he tried. Oh, he is a magnificent athlete. If you ever saw him kick a football, uh, like um, the same as hitting a golf ball, like he'd hit a golf ball like miles out of any, any further than anybody you could ever imagine. He, just, he was just the most complete natural athlete. By the time first-class cricket was shut down by the war in 1941, Miller had played 14 first-class matches for two centuries, but he'd bowled just seven overs for one wicket. Miller served with distinction as a fighter pilot during World War II. By the time he was drafted into the Australian services team for the post-war victory tests, he'd become a new ball bowler. When cricket fans in Australia heard that he was taking wickets in the victory tests in England in 1945, they must have thought it was a different Keith Miller, because the Miller before the war was not a bowler. But so the story goes, um, Miller uh, was basically throwing the ball during the victory tests at practice and said, here, have a bowl. And he then responded with some of the quickest spells ever seen and was very quickly opening the bowling. By the end of that series, Miller had become the golden boy of Australian cricket. As a kid growing up uh, in the early 50s, I mean, Keith Miller was my idol. And I mean, there couldn't have been a better cricketer to watch for a young bloke because Miller was so aggressive and such a charismatic uh, player that I just, you know, I ate up all everything that, uh, that I saw Keith Miller doing. There was a lot of depression after the war with rationing. Um, cricket grounds were jam-packed and needed players who were beyond the mundane, who were extra special, who could thrill big audiences. Miller could bowl fast off a short run, which is always an unusual thing, a very explosive thing. Uh, Miller could attack any bowling um, and was likely to get naught playing a madness shot as he was to get a hundred playing breathtaking shots. K.R. Miller is the most vivacious sportsman, any sport I've ever seen anywhere, ever. And he's a, my hero, he's the hero of all the kids of my generation. I remember, you know, when I was a kid and I had hair, you know, I used to do what Miller did, flick your hair back every time, you know. And when you went out to bat, you pull on the batting does with your teeth, as Miller did. The sight of Miller coming down to bat at Lords, just walking out there was fantastic. And he could do one or two things, he could get naught, or he could get 164 at high speed. And it didn't worry him. And I got to know Keith, very well later because we were going on to cricket tours together and you talked to him about this and he said look those test matches I don't know why they take them all so seriously and the reason was he'd been a night fighter pilot in the war over Europe now your, your life expectancy there was about three weeks during that game and he crashed once and he got away with it and he lived through it and he came back I don't think he ever worried about anything like that ever again in his life Keith Miller made his Ashes debut in 1946-47 against the touring Englishman. In his first match he made 79 and took 7 for 60 in the first innings. He scored his maiden century, 141 not out, in the fourth test. In the first test of that series on a wet track in Brisbane he took 7 wickets. Uh, this was after he'd scored 79 with the bat. Uh, he then scored 100 in Adelaide. Um, immediately a new star was born. He, it, was, it was tell he was a major figure in, in, he was going to be a major figure in international cricket. He's the best all-rounder we've produced in this country in my time. Um, 
I think he probably could have made a few more runs if he felt inclined. I don't think he really pushed himself uh, to the extent that he might have done as a batsman. But um, get his dander up with the ball in his hand, he was probably as dangerous a fast bowler as I've seen. By now, Miller with Ray Lindwall had formed one of the greatest fast bowling combinations in history. Almost a perfect bowling combination. Uh, Lindwall accurate, very quick, um, never giving anything away. And Miller at the other end, um, more mercurial. They fed off each other. Uh, Lindwall could take wickets, but he'd also keep them quiet. Uh, Batsman would be inclined, because Miller was a bit looser, to think they could get away with something, score runs off Miller, but um, uh, the fact that Lindwell had kept them quiet made them more inclined to take chances against Miller and hence more inclined to get out. Ray was the best bowler I ever saw of any type and the, his control and, and everything was just um, was perfect and when you think about it at the other end you had you know uh, Miller who was unpredictable you just didn't know what was going to come next and uh, really it's a perfect team. Keith and Ray were great pals they, they worked in unison uh, they were different types of personalities uh, Keith was a more volatile character, and Keith, of course, was a better batsman than Ray. Keith was an outstanding bowler. And um, at times, uh, when he was in the mood, Keith could be an absolutely devastating fast bowler as well. Um, but uh, it was better to use him in relatively short bursts, you know, give him three or four hours at a time. Keith was also an outstanding slip field, and he too was one of the great all-rounders that's played the game. Marvellous cricketer. In 1947, Keith Miller moved to Sydney to play for New South Wales. He would become the most popular Victorian ever to transfer his loyalties north. Keith Miller in the 1950s was the pride of Sydney and when New South Wales won nine Sheffield Shields on the trot, Miller, who of course doesn't even have a toilet named after him at the SCG as he's ready to point out, um, was the hero, but none of us kids dare try to emulate him because he was too big. He was a god. The 1948 tour of England, famous as Bradman's last campaign, was fraught with difficulty for Miller. The expectations on Miller on that tour were huge because he'd been so successful in the victory tests. And I, I don't think he lived up to those, those standards. But I didn't, didn't live up to his own high standards anyway. In 1948, Miller was having some problems with his back. I also think that it was probably all a bit too easy for Miller that tour. He, 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 would, have, he would have played better cricket if there'd been more of a challenge. And I think the fact that um, they were winning easily all the time and they were winning against uh, playing against people who were, who were Miller's friends, uh, Edrich and Compton and those people, he liked them, they were his friends. Uh, he probably didn't enjoy the easy victories against people that he liked. By now Miller was, in his own way, almost as popular as the Don himself. But he was by no means Bradman's favourite cricketer. I think the relationship between Miller and Bradman was always uneasy. Miller was very easy going and I think Bradman probably disapproved of that to an extent and there were a couple of instances uh, in England when uh, Bradman asked Miller to bowl and Miller had a bad back and threw the ball back to him. Then later on after the war um, uh, in a testimonial match Miller bowled a number of bounces at, uh, at Bradman which Bradman obviously didn't appreciate. In the 1950-51 Ashes series, Miller took 17 wickets and topped the batting averages, making an unbeaten century in Adelaide. He scored another century against the West Indies the following season and twice took five wickets in an innings. Miller was at his greatest as, a, uh, as an all-rounder, I think, in the early 50s. Um, I think he came back to Australia after the 48 tour and didn't have a very successful 48-49 series in Australia to the point that he was left out of the Australian team to South Africa in 49-50 uh, but he went over there as a late replacement when Bill Johnston was hurt in a car crash and, and went very well in South Africa so then we had reaffirmed his spot in the side for, um, 
the 50-51 Ashes Tour. And uh, he was Australia's leading player in that, in that summer and then followed up against the West Indies the season after. And that was where he really established his reputation, I think. Miller was, Miller was the star of a very good Australian team in that period. Um, and the great thing about that, the early 50s is that England had just as good a team. Uh, so you saw, you saw Miller at his best uh, competing and you saw some very good cricket. In 1955, against the West Indies, Miller once again stole the show. He made three test match centuries, including his highest test score of 147 in Kingston. Miller loved, loved the West Indies. He loved, he, he loved being there and he, he loved playing against them. I think the West Indies cricketers had more in common with, with Keith Miller than a lot of the Australian or English cricketers. There's an image of the West Indies cricketers as of carefree, carefree Caribbean cricketers, but they played at home in a very hard school, and, and the, 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 the competition within the West Indies was, was very hard, very tough. And I think Miller liked that. After Miller's match-saving 10 wickets at Lord's in 1956, Australia suffered heavy defeats in the third and fourth tests. There was media speculation that Miller might replace Ian Johnson as Australian captain. To me, it's insane that Miller was never captain of Australia. I mean, purely in terms of um, cricketing nous and cricketing ability, he was so clearly the obvious choice to be Australia's captain after Lindsay Hassett retired. And instead, the Australian selectors chose um, Ian Johnson as captain. Miller would certainly have been a more inspiring captain than, than Ian Johnson, uh, but Johnson had all the attributes of uh, solidity and reliability that Miller didn't have. Um, the fact that Johnson was chosen over Miller is, mm, uh, might well be a reflection of, of Bradman's uh, preference for um, uh, reliability uh, than sort of the volatile um, aspect that Keith Miller brought to the game. Their Majesties invited the Australian cricketers to tea at the castle. Here the Queen is talking to Miller. Probably the fact that, you know, when you toured England there was so much speech making to be made, all that sort of thing. And and really I couldn't imagine Keith... Keith probably could have done it, but, but I, I, you know, I think it would have been a, a real effort. If those in power were sceptical about Miller's suitability for the captaincy, those who played under him in domestic cricket had no such doubts. Miller captain New South Wales with imagination and flair, never reckless but often bold, prepared to risk defeat in order to win. And from time to time, the Cavalier came to the fore. Well, Miller was very good. He was uh, short on words. Sometimes uh, I've been with Miller when he's walked out onto the field with the New South Wales side and he'd look around to find uh, who's in the team. And once I heard him say, oh, just find yourself scatter. And that was it, but move one yard out of position on the field and you'd get a nod to get back there. Uh, very, very quick to, to sense uh, what was going right and wrong and uh, he was a fine captain. Miller did not play another test after 1956. He retired from all cricket in 1959. He left behind memories of astounding performances and an attitude to cricket and to life that has made him one of the most beloved figures in the game. I think that Keith Miller's impact was far greater than anybody appreciates even now. Um, the modern comparison would be in Botham in terms of the way in which they played the game and the way in which they approached life, but they were very different. Uh, the parallel would be both of them would be a pop star and Miller would be a movie star. He was, I suppose, you know, if you look at film stars, he was the Errol Flynn of, of, of cricket. He, he just loved adventure, um, like he, he batted aggressively, he bowled aggressively, and I think it was that that manner that he had, that, that ability, this freakish ability to do things. Um, and 
Uh, but to him it was so simple, yet to the normal mortal, it was impossible. Keith Miller it was a great fast bowler, terrific batsman, very good slipsman, also a good Australian rules footballer, but also a great visionary. And I can remember reading a book, I think it was called From the Grandstand, which he wrote in the late 50s. And Keith Miller at that time said, cricket, what cricket really needs in addition to test cricket, the five day game, is a shorter version of the game. And of course now we have limited over cricket. And even back in the mid 50s and late 50s, Keith Miller had, he could see that cricket needed something else just to give it a, an oomph along. And that's what, you know, back then he could see one day cricket was essential to make cricket really viable all around the world. Great visionary. Would have been a marvellous one day cricket, you know, because there you got two for the price of one, you know, a good batsman, a good bowler, and a good hitter of the ball when, you know, when uh, in that one day stuff, the ball going up all the time because he got a pitch up to him, he was tall and he was able to drive brilliantly. And as a bowler, well, you know, it's one of the greatest bowlers I've ever seen. Keith Miller played in 55 test matches. He made 2,958 runs at an average of 36.98, including seven centuries. He took 170 wickets at an average of 22.98. His bowling average places him amongst the greatest of fast bowlers. He took 38 catches. Uh, Keith Miller was a, an all-rounder of tremendous uh, charisma, uh, a personality of tremendous charisma and a wonderfully generous heart, incidentally, um, who, when he really wanted to turn it on, was a, a match winner with bat or ball. Uh, Keith was a, was a marvellous person in a team. Um, I remember breaking my ankle very badly and dislocating the, the ankle off the foot. Um, and I went back to London and I had to have treatment for about seven or eight weeks uh, with getting treatment every day. You know, Keith would come back and the first door he'd knock on was my door to see how I was getting on. And, uh, you know, little things like that are, are very personal. Everyone loved him and in England they loved him because he spent half his life over here and served during the war in the Air Force. He's larger than life and even as an elderly gentleman, he's coming to England still with a vast circle of friends and everyone wants a chat with Keith Miller stupendous personality. Did everything that you would expect a, um, a long-standing uh, pilot of the war to do once the war's over, namely that life was put into perspective a little bit more than most other people can ever get that sort of view of it and, and played his, his game batting, bowling, fielding, on the field, off the field as though tomorrow would never ever come and if it did then okay we'll try again. As a man, Keith Miller is flamboyant and larger than life. As a cricketer, he was singularly gifted and wonderfully entertaining. He holds a special place in the ranks of ESPN's Legends of Cricket.